who is entitled, Mighty is Our God. And if you are chronologically inclined, our lectionary readings are taking us back and forth between time, and so now we're jumping to Jesus' baptism. The setting is such that John is baptizing those who have come to repentance, and he states that he is doing this to prepare the people for one who is coming, who is much mightier than he. Well, all I need to do is hear that word mighty in the scriptures, and it jumps to one of my favorite <coughs> praise hymns. Mighty is our God, mighty is our King, mighty is our Lord, the ruler of everything. His name is higher, higher than any other name, and his power is greater, for he has created everything. And hopefully this is the way we all feel about Jesus. Mighty, powerful, ruler, Lord, and King. That is why we're here this morning in the sanctuary, because most of us here do feel that way about Jesus. But it's possible that someone here might be seeking at some point, might be checking out just what this Christianity thing is all about. My husband John, as you know, is a professor at Faith Theological Seminary, and he's also the director of admissions. And we were talking on Tuesday, and he was telling me about, he received an application from a Muslim man whose theology was in total opposition to Christianity. The Muslim man believes that Jesus was not divine, that he was just a prophet. So seeking truth is part of seeking Jesus. I met a woman along the way as I was visiting people in the neighborhood one day who said she prayed for truth, and she prayed for God's truth, and what she found was Mormonism. But Mormonism <coughs> is in direct opposition to Christianity as well. Mormons believe that they will become God one day. Certainly not what Christians believe. Mormons believe that the only way to be exalted and become God is by having a celestial marriage. This marriage is performed on earth and is sealed to become a heavenly or celestial permanent marriage. And this is in direct conflict with Jesus' teachings about marriage and Paul's epistles concerning marriage. Just to um, go back to that just as a reminder from Matthew 22, 24 to 30. The Sadducees were asking Jesus about marriage. They were trying to trap him, but this is his response. <clears throat> as it begins in verse 24. Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies childless, his brother shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died childless, leaving the widow to his brother. The second did the same, so also the third down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman herself died. In the resurrection, then, whose wife of the seven will she be? For all of them had married her. Jesus answered them, You are wrong, because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. When we seek truth, we will find Jesus. I once had someone tell me that they believe all religions have some truth and all religions have some error. So I was thinking about this and I thought, if I said to you, or someone said to you, two plus two equals a thousand, you know that's incorrect. And then if someone else says to you, two plus two equals seven, you know that's incorrect. And then someone else comes to you and says, well, two plus two equals minus two, you know that's incorrect. 2 plus 2 equals 4, regardless of people thinking that it equals 7 or 1,000 or anything else. Some people want to make the argument that because Islam is false and Buddhism is false and Hinduism is false, Christianity must be false as well. But when we seek truth, we will find Jesus. Another individual shared with me that they have difficulty with Christianity and its tenets because of the Catholic doctrine that they were raised with and the demand for worship. Once again, when we seek Jesus, we will find the true Jesus. The Jesus that is invitational, the Jesus that comes to the door of our hearts and knocks first. Jesus never merges in. 
John the Baptist was preparing the way for the true Jesus, not the false prophets of the day. Jesus warned the followers of his day and us to be aware of false prophets who come dressed as sheep but are actually ravenous wolves from Matthew 7.15. Jesus comes to give us life while false prophets come to take it away. Jesus Christ's love is for you and has made you a member of his family by the waters of your baptism. And because of that, there is hope. There is the promise of better things to come. When we follow Jesus Christ, he points the way to the Father, where there is hope of everlasting life in a world of peace, comfort, love, and abounding joy. When we gather as Christ's followers in worship on Sunday morning, it is a time to remember our baptism and the promises given to us by Jesus Christ himself of a future in God's kingdom with life being much easier than the rocky road of trials and temptations that we go through while we're here on this earth. As baptized children of God, we have been included by God as his children. Each of us are God's picture of salvation, not by our merits, but out of his request, his claiming us through our baptism. And after this event, our lives are a response to God's <laughs> saving grace in baptism. But I emphasize the word response, not insurance policy. Baptism brings us into God's picture of salvation, but unlike real things, we can take ourselves out of the picture by living a life that does not respond to God's act of grace. Conrad Thompson, formerly of Lutheran Vespers, tells this story. An artist was standing along a beautiful river in France, where he was painting a picture of the landscape. A group of children came by and watched the artist as he caught the beauty of the clouds, the river, and the trees with his brushes. Finally, one of the girls in the group could not contain her enthusiasm any longer and asked, Mister, can you get us into that picture? God brought us into the picture of salvation by his power through our baptism. It is a picture of beauty. However, we can make salvation something less than beautiful if we remove ourselves from it by rejecting God, His Word, His Supper, His Grace, by removing ourselves from the community of faith. Baptism is not an insurance policy to heaven, but baptism is our boarding pass to a lifetime with Jesus. a relationship with Jesus which is nourished, fed, strengthened, enriched, and kept alive by faithfully availing oneself to God's means of grace, the Word, and the sacraments, especially communion. Our journey through life with Jesus needs the encouragement, the strength, the lasting power of a faithful Free gift of God to choose to 
those who have experienced God's grace in baptism, as our faith and our trust in God's grace might grow and mature. Because we are brothers and sisters, equally in Christ, as the faithful community of Christ, we care, help, pray for, and support those brothers and sisters in the community as if they are indeed blood relatives. And I struggle with that right now. I struggle with that because June Milan is in a place where she is struggling, and I feel kind of helpless, like we cannot be there for her. She's in a situation um, which her family put her in, and we can't just go in and pull her out. I'm not exactly sure what to do for her, but through prayer, maybe someone hearing this message and hearing this need may find a solution for her. I just feel so bad. Last time I went to visit her, um, she had fallen. She hit her face. She was bleeding. She had blood in her teeth. Um, it just, it, it was just a horrible, horrible sight. And um, I just feel like as part of her Christian family, there has to be something that we can do for her. So uh, please keep her in your prayers this week. We must also pray for minister to and evangelize to those who are not members of the body so they might know the love and grace we have experienced in Christ. We must not pour the good news of Christ but give it freely to others. We are in the epiphany season of the church where we emphasize the light of Christ, the light which shines in the darkness. Christ is a light which shines in our individual lives and at the same time a light which is spread to others. And as we reflect back to our wonderful, awesome, incredible Christmas Eve service, as we're lighting those candles, <coughs> no one's candle got dimmer by lighting the candle next to theirs. What does happen when you light someone else's candle is that the light increases. Instead of one light piercing the darkness, now there are two and many, many more. Each light gives strength and courage to the other. That's what we're here for, not to go it alone, not to be private, not to hold it in, but to gather strength from our other brothers and sisters here in Christ. Each soul, each person in the body of Christ gives strength, courage, faith, and hope to the others as they walk together in the darkness of this world. We really need to stick together. There's a lot of darkness out there. So let us be invitational in spreading the light to others so that they may also see God's goodness, God's mercy, God's grace, God's peace, and God's love. With Christ as our leader, protector, healer, and sanctifier, we give him the glory.